dollars for the State Library of Massachusetts and the Museum of African American History. Just a reminder, we're in Zoom webinar, so your cameras and microphones are off. Closed captioning can be turned on or off with the live transcript button on the bottom of your screen. Questions for Dr. Gibbons can be typed into the Q&A box at any time during the program, and we'll get to as many as possible. And thank you to those of you who submitted questions um, with your registration form. We received a lot of great questions already. Now to tell us about how to buy a copy of Fugitive Pedagogy, please welcome Beth Carol Horks. Thank you, Kristen, and hello, everyone. I know you're all anxious to get to the talk, so this will be a very quick hello from the State Library of Massachusetts. I'm Beth Carol Horrocks, the head of Special Collections there. So one of the good things about this pandemic is that we've been able to expand our public programming and work with a lot of new collaborators, and that has resulted in events like tonight's. So we're very glad to be here with Dr. Gibbons to hear about his new work. So mostly, but not entirely, because his work fits in so well with our own holdings. And I'll tell you more about that at the end. But first, I'd like to remind everyone that Frugal Bookstore will be selling the book. They are a local independent bookstore and they've agreed to handle book sales for tonight's talk. Uh, there'll be more information about that later and there'll be a link in the chat as well. So now a brief welcome from the Museum of African American History, Lamurchi. Thank you, Beth. We are very pleased and we are the Museum of African American History. I am Lamurchi Frazier, Director of Education and Interpretation. We are so pleased to bring the scholars that we have tonight featured is Dr. Jarvis R. Givens. And in this field that he is working in, having to do with the history of black education and pedagogy, we are especially anchored in this conversation as one of the museum's buildings is the ABL Smith School, the first school built to educate black children as a public school starting in 1835, housing a school that started in a home of a, a, a black teacher, Primus Hall in 1798. So we are thrilled that this conversation is gonna happen with Dr. Kim Parker. We are proud to be a part of this, this uh, collaboration and we want to introduce them uh, to help you understand who they are and why they are called distinguished. Dr. Jarvis R. Givens is an assistant professor of education and African and African-American studies at Harvard University. He specializes in the history of African-American education and his first book that we will see tonight is Fugitive Pedagogy. Carter G. Woodson and the Art of Black Teaching. It was published in 2021 by Harvard University Press. His research has been supported by fellowships and grants from the Ford Foundation, the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, the William F. Milton Fund, and published in peer-reviewed journals such as the American Education Research Journal, SOULS, Harvard Educational Review and race, ethnicity, and education. Professor Givens earned his PhD in African-American studies from the University of California, Berkeley, and he is a fellow at, uh, at Radcliffe University. Dr. Kimberly Ian Parker is an educator, literary consultant, and writer based in Boston and holds a steadfast belief in the power of literacy to normalize the high achievement of all students, especially Black, Latinx, and other children of color. Kim is currently the director of the Crimson Summer Academy at Harvard University and is completing a book with the Association, with the Association for Curriculum and Supervision Development to document her successful literary work based on her classroom and professional development and uh, to document her successful literary work based on her classroom and professional development experiences 
anticipated spring 2022. We look forward to that. Kim is the 2020 recipient of the National Council of Teachers of English Outstanding Elementary Educator Award, a co-founder of the hashtag Disrupt Text and hashtag 31 Days IBO BPOC, and the current president of the Black Educators Alliance of Massachusetts, referred to as BEAM. We are very grateful for these scholars coming tonight to enlighten us on their work to have a conversation. I would like to then now turn over the digital platform and podium to Dr. Jarvis who will introduce us to the context of his book and help us to understand what it is that he is bringing to reform education in America. Thank you so much, uh, Lamerchi, for that uh, wonderful and a beautiful introduction. Um, I'm welcome. excited to be here in conversation today with Dr. Parker. Um, We've been having conversations about this book that I've been writing since I arrived in Boston in 2016 after I finished my PhD. Um, and I've been attending a number of events hosted by Beam, which has been a wonderful just kind of space for me to reflect on the history that I'm writing in conversation with um, very, very um, uh, wonderful educators and practitioners um, and to think across our various levels of expertise. Uh, and so I'm excited to share some kind of high level ideas about the book and what I'm calling fugitive pedagogy um, before I, we transition into a conversation between myself and Dr. Parker. Um, and I'll say that these, these opening comments that I'll share um, will be about 12 minutes. And then after that period, we'll, I'll come, I'll, I'm gonna share some slides with that, but then after that, we'll transition into the conversation um, between Dr. Parker and I, and then after that, an open conversation with the audience. So, Fugitive Pedagogy, Carter G. Woodson, and the Art of Black Teaching is my attempt to offer a more balanced account of African-American education, a history that requires the embrace of competing narratives, persecution, and resistance. While I was initially drawn to the subversive practices of Black teachers and their students, I found the language of resistance, or the challenging of power, to be accurate but insufficient. Scholars often focus on Black people's struggle to gain access to education, desegregation through courts, and exceptional narratives of educational achievement. The everyday character of Black resistance, however, has largely gone unacknowledged. Thus, attending to this aspect of Black educational life in the 19th century through Jim Crow has required new and dynamic language. Fugitivity names more precisely the form that resistance takes in these contexts. Fugitivity is covert, concealed, hidden, planning an intentional strategy. And what I call fugitive pedagogy consists of African-Americans physical and intellectual acts that explicitly challenged anti-Black protocols of educational domination. Actions that often took place in discrete or partially concealed fashion. And so to illuminate key aspects of fugitive pedagogy, I'd like to begin with a scenario that, opened, that, I, that I've used to open this book. Tessie McGee read to her class in a steady measured tone, quietly engaging, engaging in a calculated act of subversion. She was black, 28 years old, and taught history in 1933 at the only black secondary school in Webster Parish, Louisiana. The state's all white Department of Education and local school board gave clear instructions. Teachers were to keep the pre-approved outline openly displayed on their desks, which they were to follow closely to assure that their students became acquainted with the targeted learning objectives. Black educators and families in Webster Parish had little formal control over curriculum Yet on many occasions, McGee made what she deemed to be necessary revisions to the mandatory curriculum based on her own judgment and perhaps at the recommendation of fellow black teachers, she often read passages from Carter G. Woodson's book on the Negro, 
which rested comfortably in her lap. She kept the textbook out of sight, understanding that if she were to be caught, she would be vulnerable to the disciplinary practices of Jim Crow authorities. But she was undeterred. Quote, she read to us from that book, one of McGee's students recounted. When the principal would come in, she would simply lift her eyes to the outline that resided on the desk and teach us from the outline. When the principal disappeared, her eyes went back to the book in her lap, end quote. So for the remainder of my time for these short remarks, I wanna look closely at two pieces of this scenario, the teacher and the textbook. I'll offer a short reading of Ms. McGee's effort to escape the official curriculum by way of the hidden transcript literally resting on her lap and how Woodson's textbook, The Negro and Our History, rendered a competing narrative of black life that defied racist school policies and curricula. The teacher. Tessie McGee's method of instruction constitutes a textbook example of fugitive pedagogy. Her concealed lesson rejected the degrading representations of black life in the official school curricula and such refusal manifested in physical form. McGee's public display of the official outline was a masked performance of complicity, an embodied text that accompanied the subversive and spoken content of her lesson. McGee's physical act of switching texts also communicated important messages to her students, demonstrating how defiance could at times be disguised by public performances of deference to the coercive regime of school authorities. Teachers like McGee gained access to alternative scripts of knowledge through what the sociologist Alden Morris has called insurgent intellectual networks. Institutions like Carter G. Woodson's Association for the Study of Negro Life and History and Black Teacher Associations. Such organizations comprised a veiled yet networked educational world. One where Black Americans said one thing and did another. Given rampant anti-Black violence, the true political intentions undergirding Black educational strivings were rarely on full display. African Americans responded, often in quiet, calculated acts of resistance against oppressive school settings that reflected a world order built on their subjection. Fugitive pedagogy was a collective endeavor even when manifesting as individual acts of practice. For example, the principal entering McGee's classroom was a black man named J.L. Jones. And records suggest that he supported the inclusion of black history and culture at Webster Parish. He was a leading member in the Louisiana Colored Teachers Association, which explicitly endorsed Carter G. Woodson and his work. And Woodson regularly appeared on programs at the annual meetings of Black teacher associations at both the state and national level. And what you see on the screen are, you know, to the left is Carter G. Woodson's members, life membership card in the National Black Educators Association, but then also a clipping from a newspaper. And there are many of these where we see Woodson appearing, speaking at their annual um, state and national events. It is not implausible then to consider that Jones and Tessie McGee may have very likely conspired together. The principal testing the teacher to ensure she could protect herself and the school if a white official entered, her, entered the room. Wearing the mask, as poet Paul Lawrence Dunbar called it, had long been part and parcel of black teachers' professional disposition. And in black segregated schools, the intrusion of white surveillance had a hand in shaping school ecology. It was not atypical for white people to drop by unannounced during the school day, either to show off their Negro school to visitors or for some routine inspection. Such visits were primarily meant to demonstrate power, which was essential, of course, to reproducing domination. And so this is, say, is to say essentially that the person walking into McGee's classroom could just as easily have been a white school official. Black educators had to walk a tightrope when challenging such oppressive schooling contexts, because if they were to fall or be caught, there was no safety net to catch them. And just a few years prior, the white school board in Muskogee, Oklahoma, which was heavily influenced by the Ku Klux Klan, I should say, had learned of Woodson's textbook being used at the local black high school. The books were confiscated, 
teachers were reprimanded, and the principal was threatened and forced to resign. After reading the textbook, the school board, quote, expressed horror and surprise that such a work should have crept into our Negro schools, end quote. They assured their white constituents that they will be more vigilant moving forward, stating, quote, we must not take in teachers who will create discord by teaching isms of any sort, end quote. An example such of this kind of violent oversight are plentiful and they move forward and backwards in time as far as black teachers are concerned. They were routinely targeted and fired for challenging white authority. And some notable examples of this are, just, are represented by the images on the screen. Ida B. Wells having been fired in Memphis, Tennessee, John W. Davison in Georgia, Anna Julia Cooper in Washington, DC, and Septima Clark in South Carolina. And yet there were black teachers who lost more than their jobs. Harry and Harriet Moore were fired in 1946 and later killed when their home was bombed in Mims, Florida. Black teachers' awareness of such stories prompted them at times to conceal their pedagogical objectives in the presence of intrusive white power. Subjection to surveillance and violence motivated by no causal logic whatsoever was a fact of blackness. African-American educators developed strategies to contest this reality, which ranged from broad institutional realms down to the interpersonal and psychic levels. And so fugitivity in its historical reference holds in place the realities of both the constraint and black Americans constant straining against said confinement. It is careful not to overstate one or the other. And as the poet Fred Moten aptly notes, and I'm paraphrasing here, he says, escape is an activity. It's not an achievement the possible threat of recapture always lingered. Escape was unresolved and uncertain and black teachers carried intimate knowledge of such precarity. So finally, the textbook. My concern with historical framings of black education began with the textbook. I had come across passing references to Carter G. Woodson's textbook, one of which you see pictured on the screen, being read by a group of junior high students in 1930s New Orleans. I was aware that Woodson played a central role in African-American studies as the second African-American to receive a PhD from Harvard in 1912 and as the founder of Negro History Week in 1926, which we now of course celebrate as Black History Month. But I was shocked to learn about the size of his impact on educational practice during Jim Crow in the private spaces of Black teachers' classrooms. While most accounts emphasize his role as a historian, affectionately referring to him as the father of black history, much less has been written about Woodson's 30 year career as a public school teacher and leader among educators. And yet Woodson worked fervently from his office at 1538 9th Street Northwest in the historic Shaw District in Washington DC. And from this post, Woodson responded personally to letters written by individual teachers. Some wrote him with historical questions. Others inquired in hushed tones about how they might strategically work to challenge curriculum standards on a local level. Woodson and his small staff mailed textbooks to individual teachers in schools around the country. They packaged Negro history kits by hand and shipped off decorative materials for teachers to refashion their classrooms. The wide circulation of his ideas and curriculum materials among black teachers implied a much more complicated narrative than the story suggested by pervasive images of dilapidated school buildings and the aggressive neglect of black education that tend to dominate our public memory and in large part academic scholarship on the subject. What intrigued me most about Woodson's textbooks as well as those written by black public school teachers before him was their extensive commemoration of fugitive slaves and black fugitive life. As early as 1890, black educators wrote textbooks that were filled with heroic narratives about enslaved blacks who absconded from plantations, those who led slave revolts, stories of black maroon communities in the dismal swamps of Virginia, Suriname, Brazil, and Jamaica. But that's not all. 
the fugitive slave emerged as what I would refer to as a folk hero and, and a curricular sim, a cultural symbol and curriculum developed by these educators. The fugitive slave also appeared in school naming practices and within commemorative ceremonies and school activities and rituals. Black Americans established a heroic tradition around the stories and names associated with this pedagogy of escape. So what I'm trying to say is that this idea and this language of fugitivity is more than an elaborate metaphor. It names a phenomenon that surfaced in the archive at multiple levels. And finally, it was clarifying to learn that the first black textbooks were actually written by fugitive slaves. James W.C. Pennington, an escaped slave from Maryland, inaugurated this tradition in 1841. A textbook on the origins and history of the colored people represents the beginning of a formalized practice of black people striving to rewrite the epistemological order. The fugitive slave William Wells Brown also wrote a textbook in 1863. So like newspapers, journals, and various other forms of 19th century black print culture, textbooks became tools, not only of the master, but also of the fugitive slave. And in his first textbook, The Negro in Our History, Carter G. Woodson offered the following. How some of these slaves learned in spite of opposition makes a beautiful story. Knowing the value of learning as a means of escape and having longing for it too because it was forbidden, many slaves continued their education under adverse circumstances. Here, Woodson named the entanglement of violent white opposition and the enslaved people's steady practice of learning as a means of escape, offering it as a generative lesson for students and educators during Jim Crow. Indeed, this was the origin story that framed what was politically at stake in their teaching and learning. This dialectic was the heritage of Black education. At its highest calling, Black education continued to be a stealing away from and refusal of the American school's official protocols and curriculum. Uh, so I want to stop there and I want to invite uh, my good friend here, Dr. Parker, to uh, join me in conversation, having read the book and heard various iterations of what I just shared with you all who might be hearing it for the first time. Um, but I just wanted to make sure that we had a kind of shared foundation to engage in this conversation. Um, because I know we'll be talking about bits and pieces of the book, but I wanted to make sure that folks had a kind of full range and understanding of what I'm referring to when we talk about this idea of um, a fugitive pedagogy. Dr. Gibbons, it's always so great to um, be sharing space with you. And I think what um, I appreciate is that your book is so robust in thinking about um, Woodson as person and his own educational journey and then his work. And so you're right there. We're just gonna, I just have a couple of questions knowing that we're so limited by time. And again, if folks have um, questions, please put them in the chat box or in the Q and A. Um, but it's such, a, and I also will encourage people to spend a lot of time with this book because as a teacher, right, I explained to you earlier that it was so important to feel, to know that the work that I and so many of my colleagues are doing and have done co connects to this really broad historical tradition. So um, that's, it was sort of the book that I needed at the moment. So thank you. Um, and I wanna focus on, the work or what the you use this term scholars of the practice and I want to see if you could talk a little bit about what does that mean for black educators yeah thanks uh thanks thanks for that question and when I use the language of scholars of the practice um in this historical context is also and also gesturing towards something about the present is you know when I was when I was studying and kind of you know researching and writing about this history it just really stood out to me this very robust, this very robust intellectual community that these black educators were a part of. You know, their lives, live, the lives of people like Tessie McGee or even JL Jones, right, who was the principal of this rural school in Louisiana in the 1930s, is that their lives extended far beyond that kind of local community because they were also a part of these networked institutions where you see people like Carter G. Woodson, Mary McLeod Bethune you know, Ida B. Wells being a very early member of one of the organizations in Tennessee and also the national organizations 
and they're sharing ideas in terms of what they're writing about, in terms of you know what we might think of as kind of uh, black intellectual scholarship during the time period. And you see school teachers interacting with this material, or, or actually, you know, Carter G. Woodson himself is a school teacher, right? Mm -hmm. And even though he has a PhD, um, and, he, and we see teachers wrestling with important intellectual questions about what is the meaning of education um, in society as a whole, but in particularly, what is the meaning of education for the lives of Black people? Some of them, you know, at certain points, just one generation um, mm -hmm. removed from slavery. At certain periods, not even one, you know, barely even one generation removed, right? When we think of someone like Carter G. Woodson, who was born in 1875 and dies in 1950, mm -hmm. right? He's he is the he's the child and the student of former slaves, right? His first teachers are his formerly enslaved uncles, and so, in these and these are the same people who created these intellectual networks and professional organizations for teachers. Um, and so, when I say scholars of the practice, is that they're they're concerned with more than just the transactional aspects of teaching. It's not just about the, the procedural aspects of what do you do in the classroom, but it's also about how what you're doing in the classroom is connected to broader sets of political issues that they understood themselves to be concerned with, but also having to be well studied on the very structures of education that they find themselves within, right? Structures of education that were quite hostile to their very existence. Right, so this required them to be not just self-reflective, but to also to also seek out intellectual resources to enhance um, their work, and so, and sometimes actually produce those very uh, educational resources um, in absence of you know because those those things were not being um, offered to them through traditional teacher training pathways um, or you know the formal curriculum of the Louisiana. State Department of Education in the 1930s, let alone in the decades you know prior to that. Yes, and I think that that was so important and also gives us a way of thinking about the work for Black educators that we still need to be doing. And I was struck by what you said in that there would be these academic spaces, right? And teachers would be right there sharing, um, participating and being valued um, in ways that I, I don't necessarily know that is happening today. Um, so I really, really appreciate that. I also appreciate how Woodson talked about how Black teachers had to um, sort of confront their own miseducation. And um, was wondering if you could say a little bit more about that too. Yeah. So this is, this is one of the big parts of the miseducation of the Negro is, you know, when Woodson writes that book in 1933, he's saying that one of the things that teachers have to confront is the ways you know, he, he says himself as well, the way we can become complicit in the kind of um, the larger project of the American school that is not serving the best interests of black people and black students. And that it's important to recognize that as teachers who, at, like he himself, you know, he had degrees from Harvard, University of Chicago, Maria. his first, you know, classroom was in Buckingham County, Virginia being taught by his formerly enslaved uncles, but he was taught based on, you know, uh, textbooks and readers that were created for all students in Virginia, mm -hmm. right? That were espousing very, um, you know, th that didn't talk about black life and culture at all, right? And when it did, had very kind of distorted representations of black life and culture. And so he's saying that if teachers are to, to offer students a, a new body of knowledge and a new way of understanding themselves and their conditions, where are they going to get this information from if they're if we're relying on the same um, scripts of knowledge that were created to serve the interests of those who benefit from our oppression, right, then how, how can that be the basis of a, of a liberatory model of education? So he's raising questions about the ideological orientation of teacher training and, and Black educators approach to teaching, even even if your intentions are to kind of pass on and to teach students to kind of struggle and, and, and challenge, um, you know, oppressive conditions, it's like, well, the question becomes, what are the resources you're giving them to engage mm -hmm. to battle against these challenges if you're relying on the same, um, you know, these same uh, historical narratives and historical myths, right? And so, so Woodson is kind of raising a, crit a critique of teachers, and some people have taken that to the extreme to say that Woodson you know, understood, you know, you know, didn't believe in black teachers or he was just very critical of black teachers. But the thing is interesting is that Woodson is 
as he's writing these things, the people he's speaking to are actually black teachers sitting in the audience. Yeah. You know, and if, if, for instance, if anybody has gone to a black church, right, you can have the pastor talking to an audience of black, you know, parishioners talking about, you know, how you're not doing right in the world and, you know, you're sitting in the world and they're nodding and agreeing, right, because it's, it's a form of political representation. He's creating, crafting an image of the kind of what the what the kind of dominant scripts of American education want black teachers to enact and to do and to say that you have to be aware of these kind of ideological forces that are at play through curriculum, through the kind of uh, traditional pathways of teacher training. And you have to recognize how your political in, um, investments are at odds or might be at odds with those very things. And if they are, then you have to kind of develop a set of protocols that are, that are set apart from that. Right. And so this that, that's one of the major things that Woodson is trying to get teachers to understand is you have to have a political clarity around those things. Where do you stand? What, what, what's the what's the moral imperative of your work, which might be at odds with the demands and the procedures of the school structure that you're being forced to work within? Right. This is what's embodied by Tessie McGee. She has the official outline, but she's choosing to do something different. She's choosing to depart from that even as she sometimes is having to kind of comply, right? That's right. And then um, in the spaces, right? I wanna shift a little bit to talking about black teacher associations and um, thinking too about how, what's the work now for black teacher associations, right? Um, Woodson, I think has left a tremendous legacy for that sort of fast forwarding to today. What does that look like now? And, and also how can, I think, black teacher organizations respond to black teachers in ways that sort of links us all together? One of the very important things about the networked world of black teachers that I try to emphasize is to demonstrate that even at, for instance, with the book, I open up with this story about Tessie McGee, but I, I, I wanted to be intentional to kind of pan out and to say, it's not just about these kind of individual acts of practice, but it's about a professional disposition that was cultivated in a kind of, in a professional world that had its own set of professional standards about what their work as educators were supposed to be, right? So we can't fully understand what a teacher like Tessie McGee is doing or what Carter G. Woodson is doing without understanding this network of, you know, these, interlock these intellectual interlocutors that they are a part of um, to, to, to understand, you know, the broader range of the political project they're engaging in. And I say that that's important because these institutions were in place to advocate on behalf of educators and what was, you know, you know, in the best needs of their professional group, but also to establish a shared agenda about what was important for black education more broadly, because we know that individual teachers are vulnerable, right? So when someone, whether it be Septima Clark or whether it be a, a number, a host of black teachers who are fired in places like Alabama, right, prior to Brown v. Board of Education, you have the Alabama State Teachers Association, which is the Black Teacher Association, who is working to advocate on behalf of these teachers um, to make sure that, you know, you have this, these organizations are, are working as an advocacy base, right, where individual teachers can be removed, the larger project is still kind of upheld by this networked um, kind of organization that is working in tandem with the interests of individual teachers and students, right? So that's one of the things that I think is an important lesson in the historical context, but that's also important in the current moment, right? We know that there are, um, you know, there are black teachers in many places that are, that, that feel alienated in terms of some of the work that they're doing. And not just black teachers, there are other educators as well who are trying to align themselves with a tradition that extends from this history of black educators, right? Um, and they might, oftentimes they feel like they're doing that work alone, right? Mm -hmm. Historically, we know that there's a model to kind of work to connect educators, such as a Wilhelmina Crossan in Boston, right? Who is, you know, one of very few black teachers working in Boston in the 1930s and 40s, but who's connected to Carter G. Woodson's association, right? And who is um, in conversation with this networked world of educators where you have these sharing of resources and sharing of strategies, um, that, that's, that's still in, a very important you know, model of organizing uh, towards some important and shared political end. Yeah, thank you. Now, I, um, 
I was taken by Mary McLeod Bethune's um, request or sort of demand that academics sort of be, and we need interpreters. So people who could um, take the work of academics in academic spaces and translate it to the masses. And so I'm wondering, right, like what, what's the responsibility for folks like you and other academics for to get the message and the sort of the help to black teachers who are in schools and community members and families and everyone else. Yeah, because that is what Woodson did. Yeah, that absolutely is. But you know, but that's also so so this it was what Woodson did. But again, this is where in the book, I try to use Woodson as the central figure, but it's always important for me to kind of pan out to talk about these people who are around him, like a Mary McLeod Bethune, who was the president of the National Association of Teachers and Colored Schools, right? And let, yes, and I will say, you're right. You are exactly right, right? And I'm trying, you're exact. Thank you for that correction because I think it is really easy to say he is one person, but yes, it's a very well, well-networked well community of folks. And, and one, but one of the things I'm trying to emphasize there is that I thank you for pulling that direct quote from that um, speech that Mary McLeod Bethune is giving. I think that the year is 1935, it might mm -hmm. be referencing. The audience that she's speaking to is at the annual meeting of Woodson's Association. The majority of the members at that time, there weren't very many black PhDs in history at the time, even though this was an academic organization, the large, the membership base of that organization were actually teachers, right? So when she's saying this work of, it's important to have translators doing this work, that's a call to action for the intellectual responsibility that she's saying teachers have to read and engage the scholarship that Woodson and other people are putting out through the Journal of Negro History, um, you know, the Journal of Negro Education, and to do the work of translating that to the, you know, their own practices, right? So the translators that she's she's saying that teachers are should understand there is to be their responsibility to do this work of translating this new scholarship that's coming out from Black scholars and Black educators and to interpret it to the capacity, you know, to the needs of, you know, black students in high schools and colleges in, um, in, you know, at the K through 12 level, right? And the following year, Mary McLeod Bethune becomes the president of Woodson's organization, right? He's the director of research, but she's the president. And one of the very first things that become imp becomes implemented in the Association for the Study of Negro Life and History is the Negro History Bulletin, where we see school teachers are writing articles and columns um, in the Negro History Bulletin that are based on research that's being done in Woodson's Journal of Negro History, right? So that, and that work of interpreting for the masses um, is actually something that she's saying, why, why scholars and K through 12 educators have to be a part of a kind of shared intellectual project, right? It's not just good enough to get this information to academics if the actual goal is to transform the, the foundations of the educational system that we're offering to the students of our communities, right? Is what she's saying. Yes, and I love the, both the call to action and the invitation, right? If we're not already in it to be part of this shared intellectual project, which I feel like we are, like I, you know, I'll ask you a thousand questions about things and you are so willing and even to come and talk to the children. So I appreciate that. And I think that that is really the work of um, making sure that it continues. And so I know we're about to move to Q&A. I wonder if you could just tell us one, or give us one example from the book and your research about sort of the impact on students um, that helped to show that they were right in it with their teachers as well. Yeah, so there's so, there's so many stories. Actually, that was my, my favorite part about writing the book is when I decided that I wanted to seek out student narratives to, add a different kind of dimension. And so the, the last chapter is this, I explored this idea of, of the black student as witness, right? To expand the historical record, because for instance, that story about Tessie McGee, I wouldn't have gotten, I wouldn't have had access to that story had it not been for Jerry Moore, who was her 16 year old high school student who remembered what she did and who talked about it, who wrote about it and repeated that story in multiple different interviews that I found about him in different places, right? And so, the story of, so in order to fully appreciate what happened in the private spaces of black teachers classrooms, I couldn't only rely on formal archival records because many of these things that black teachers were doing, they were doing, um, you know, out of resistance to 
you know, the policies and practices of the local school boards and things that they were supposed to be doing, right? So black students, um, and, and it's important to note that students are aware that they're seeing their teachers navigate power in the context of their schools in this way. And one of the things that became important for me was to demonstrate how these very, these same students that were in these classrooms, you know, we have to, we have to place black teachers critical pedagogy at the center of the history of the civil rights movement of things like the black power era and just you know the, the longer black freedom struggle in general we can't think about john lewis or angela davis or sonia sanchez right or martin luther king jr without thinking about you know well did they just kind of fall out of the sky or did they where did they get these ideas from right but then we see that oh they were in in their autobiographies they'll talk about the things that their teachers exposed them to right um, so the narratives of students were very, very important, right? Um, in, in talking about, for instance, you know, this John Bracey in Washington, D.C. saying, they sang the Black National Anthem every morning in their classrooms in the 1940s, but when a white school superintendent came, they made all the students practice the Star Spangled Banner, and they had to sing the Star Spangled Banner, right? And he was confused. He's like, well, every other day we sing the Black National Anthem. We sing Lift Every Voice and Sing, right? So we see the way that students are having to also engage in this fugitive pedagogical tradition because in many ways their the vulnerability of black children in Jim Crow is very much so bound up with the vulnerability of their teachers and these communities are very clear about that um, and we see those sorts of narratives over and over again in, in different places. Oh and I so appreciated hearing the children and their voices I thought that that was a fitting way to bring um, your work to a close um, and so now um, it's Q&A time, Dr. Gibbons. And I think um, Lamarchi and I are going to moderate this for you. Absolutely. It yeah. is my pleasure to moderate that with you and to have be in conversation with you and Dr. Gibbons. Um, I just want to say that we do appreciate and are grateful to our audience for their questions and we want to honor uh, some of what they are saying. But if you don't get your question answer, answered, by the book, mm -hmm. by the book, seek your questions in the book, your answers are there. Okay, so <laughs> just a, a commercial here. But anyway, <laughs> <laughs> I just want to know, Dr. Givens, what is the universal world you allow us to visit in your book? How is this um, research that you've done uh, giving us an eye to renewal? Mm -hmm. And I took, can you can you ask the first part of that question again about you said the universe the universe or world or world that you are allowing us to visit through your book through your research what is it and you know how does it play into the critical uh, exercise of renewal for us? Yeah, well, one one of the things that I'm trying to I, I wanted to kind of tap into what I would think about as the kind of interiority of black life in, 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 in terms of their educational strivings um, during from the period of slavery up and through Jim Crow. I think that so many of the narratives that we've had have offered, have been framed by really the kind of legal strategy of the Brown v. Board decision is that we, ha we had to kind of drill home this narrative of deficiency, of lack of resources, of dilapidated schools in order to kind of make the point um, for you know why Brown was necessary, right? And we have to make sure we understand that as a legal strategy, but we can't take that to be the full reality and the full range of Black people's lives, is that Black education has not only been about Black suffering, right? There were, you know, when writing this book, I wanted to take seriously these experiences of joy and beauty that Black folks were creating and experiencing, even as I wanted to take seriously the structural neglect that is very much so endemic to the story of black education as well. And so if I'm gonna talk about, you know, what is the kind of the universe of, you know, this world that I'm thinking about, this is, I, I wanted to get at what Du Bois would talk about is stepping behind the veil and to talk about black life, the way that black people experienced it, which is always between these competing forces of both persecution and their resistance and their, and their insistence that they are full human beings that, that experience the kind of full range of humanity. And so, so, so that's what I wanted to get at. But if I was to kind of even go beyond that, 
I would say that this particular story of, of Black folks in terms of education also says something about a kind of universal human narrative as well that I think is important, is that at, the, at, at a fundamental level, this is a story about a persecuted people working to navigate power and to resist power and to resist domination, particularly in the context of schooling, right? But you know, there's a very long history of persecuted people seeking out um, you know, moments of kind of respite and, and opportunities for education that were kind of life-giving and affirming in particular ways. And this is what's fundamentally what a liberatory model of education is. And Black folks just have a very long history of that in the modern world in, in, you know, and in the US. And, that, and that's something that I wanted to lift up um, to kind of hold against these kind of the, the very limited narratives and frames that we, we've typically been given to think about this, uh, you know, the Black educational past. Yes. And um, in, in, in tandem with that, we think about the uh, 18th and 19th century efforts of people who were enslaved and who were not uh, petitioning for funds for education and then building their schools. So across an arc in these centuries that you have now um, helped us to understand more about through the works of Carter G. Woodson, you then have also people, iconic people like William Monroe Trotter. And I wanted to ask from Kelvin, uh, uh, Kevin Elmer, who was teaching at Roxbury Community College, was there co collaboration between Carter G. Woodson and William Monroe Trotter that you know of in, your, in what you've done here, uh, pertinent to what Boston is, is doing? Yeah, so I haven't seen any, I didn't see any kind of direct correspondences between um, William Monroe Trotter and Woodson, but one of the things that I do know is that there is definitely a connection to educators and scholars in Boston. One of the names that I mentioned and lifted up is Wilhelmina Crossan, who was a school teacher and, you know, who communicated with Woodson very uh, regularly. And when the, when the one year that Woodson's association hosted its annual conference in Boston in the 1940s, she was the person that kind of rallied the local black community to put together a kind of host committee and to actually host a successful conference, even though everyone else outside of Boston said, there's no way we can have a successful conference around the study of Negro life and history in Boston because it's too far away from the South and there's not enough black people there, right? Mm -hmm. but, you know, in the Journal of Negro History after that year, Woodson talked about this kind of amazing conference that Wilhelmina Cross and as a school teacher, right? And as a member of, you know, a local Baptist church in Roxbury and you know, a member of other local organizations was able to kind of pull together based on the local networks here in Boston, right? Um, so there's the connection to Boston that I know of. I, I can't think of anything about William Monroe Trotter, but there's absolutely a Boston connection and especially through Wilhelmina Crossan. Okay, so I do wanna ask both you uh, and Kim uh, 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 about this idea of love. You've written on um, young black men and uh, we dare say love. And this, this element that seems to be present that we don't really talk about it very much, but the passion that teachers have in terms of educating children who look like them and how um, uh, Mel King uh, as an activist in Boston says, love is the question and the answer. How embedded critically is this element in what you're doing, Kim, with Black teachers and, a, and an association, and what you've done, Jarvis, to even reveal and uncover this work. Yeah, I will just jump in. At BEAM, I mean, I think that I've been um, renewed over and over again by our membership's immense love for Black children. Um, it's at the heart of everything um, we do. We think about like what's what's best for them and their families, what is missing from schools, what do we need to do as a, as a Black community of educators and, you know, an educator and community writ large um, to make sure that we are meeting the needs of our children. Um, and so I've, I mean, I think that we, we start and end with love for our kids. And I think that that's where um, we find our motivation. That's why we continue pushing for policy. That's why we continue pushing for, as Dr. Gibbons was talking about, really the retention of Black teachers, because we know that a Black teacher who, you know, knows their stuff and loves Black children is supremely effective. Yes. And one 
um, Dr. Jarvis, I mean, yeah. Dr. Givens. Yeah. <laughs> I, I was gonna give my, my comment, but then I thought about this quote from Carter G. Woodson in The Miseducation of the Negro, mm -hmm. which I think is relevant to read. Um, and he says, if the educated Negro would fall in love with his own people and begin to sacrifice for their uplift, if the highly educated Negro would do these things, he could begin to solve some of the problems now confronting the race, right? So Woodson, this is, this is a line that most people don't tend to quote from the miseducation of the Negro, but he's, Woodson is always about kind of centering this idea of love in the work that he's doing, right? We can't understand the, the extreme sacrifices he's making <laughs> without understanding this deep um, and abiding love that he has for Black people because, you know, when we think about his, he, be, he becomes this kind of, uh, this, this Harvard PhD, you know, later in life, but his very first, you know, encounter with thinking about the power of education is him having to read to his illiterate formerly enslaved father, right? Or him having to read to um, Civil War veterans who he worked alongside in the coal mines of West Virginia, who couldn't read and write, but who would kind of pull him and say, hey, can you read to us from these black newspapers or, um, you know, these books by African Americans or even mainstream white newspapers. And he's interacting with these people and they're offering their own commentary on what he's reading from the written word that they have no capacity to decipher. But for Woodson, that's important because he comes to recognize that even as these folks are illiterate, right? They are kind of re walking repositories of knowledge, right? They have the ability to interact with literate culture and to um, offer incisive analysis about the world surrounding them, right? And so this is the kind of love for Black people and the full range of the knowledge that they carried with them and what they had to offer and why he was so committed to saying, wait, Black people do have history and it is a history worthy of respect, despite what my professors at Harvard told me when I was trying to get a PhD, right? So that, that's absolutely a very, you know, from a place of love and it's at the center of the work that he's doing. Yes, and so that, that leads me to, um, to also say that I, I grew up in a segregated uh, school system with its own black board in, in uh, Jacksonville, Florida, and the love is, was witnessed there. And um, what becomes um, linked to a question one of our, this, our audience members is asking um, becomes a focus here. Uh, how are Black students impacted by not receiving Black teaching mm -hmm. at schools where there are no Black teachers? And then uh, what is being done about handling this situation to um, help our students love themselves and see their own identities as whole and be complete human beings in this educational narrative that they now rest with and are wrestling with. Yeah. So um, the, the question is, what is this um, um, going forward? How do we prevent the displacement mm -hmm. of the love of self, the displacement of teachers of color and um, their reference to a lens that helps everybody be liberated? Um, and and the, the, if the two of you could expound on that, it would be critical. Well, one of the things that I will say first, and then Dr. Parker, you can jump in as well, is that, you know, to this question about the, um, you know, a, a large number of Black students not having access to um, African-American educators. Um, and, and I also, and, and I think it's always, so one, we know that there are these studies that have just demonstrated time and again, the positive impact that having black teachers and also having black teachers early on um, can have on the life chances of, of students, right? When we think about the fact that, uh, you know, there's the studies about black children have at least um, one black teacher before the end of third grade. I think they're like 13% more likely to kind of go on to college. If they have two, it's over 32%. Right, but then there's other work that demonstrates that black teachers are more likely to recommend, you know, um, black students that are performing at the same level of white students for gifted honors and AP courses and things like that. Whereas white teachers um, controlling for the same academic performance, you know, are less likely to recommend black students for advanced placement courses and things like that. So we do know that there, there's study after study that have demonstrated 
why it's important to have more African American um, educators in the classroom for Black students, but also for you know e even more than just Black students. Um, so th those are some of the things that that I would say. Um, but but in terms of trying to uh, make sure that there are that Black teachers are not leaving the profession, we also have to raise questions about why they're leaving the profession, right? And this is where I think that the work of you know the history of Black teacher associations are very important and instructive for the kinds of advocacy organizations and the kind of networks and support systems that are important um, for educators in order to kind of recruit them and sustain them and also to allow them to be their full selves and their best selves in, in, in the teaching profession. But I'm sure Dr. Parker has you know great things to add to add there. Well, I'm also watching the time. So I will say too that I co-sign everything you did say and to think too that you know it's a response it's more than just the responsibility of black teachers, right? It's the associations, it's the community, it's other people um, who will stand up for them when it does get tough and to remind them that they are not alone. Um, because I think that that's also, retention um, is really a critical issue too. Yes, um, I, I do want to thank both Dr. Givens and Dr. Parker for this exciting conversation. Um, I'm so compelled to just tell everybody, get the book, get the book, get the book, get the book, spend the money, spend the money. It's worth it, worth it, it's worth it. it. It's, it's worth more it. valuable than we know. And to, uh, to embrace this idea of that, which is resistant uh, pedagogy, that, that pedagogy that we need to survive today in all classrooms. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I wanna thank you, uh, Dr. Parker. And I wanna thank you, Dr. Givens for giving us of yourselves and your time to expand this narrative that must be our mandate to do. So thank you so much for that. And as we uh, highlight what is happening at each, each of our institutions, it will be supportive of the kind of work that you all are doing in, in the vineyard and uh, as you keep on with your task of um, reforming education and asking those uh, very important questions that you dare to with unap unapologetically. So thank you so much. All right. Thank you. I do want to say on behalf of the Museum of African American History, its board and staff and CEO, uh, uh, Leon Wilson, that we have some events coming up. We want to invite you to a conversation with Boston mayoral candidates on systemic racism, Wednesday, June 16th at 6 p.m. Please join us. It will be moderated by Karen Holmes Ward, and I am sure she has great moderation for you to understand what these candidates have to say. Our Nantucket lecture series uh, coming up is the Black Activism on Nantucket Before the Civil War, presented by the scholar Barbara Ann White as one of our um, uh, lecture series that will be moderate, moderated by me. Uh, and so we want to invite you to the Museum of African American History as we support these efforts in education and expanding the American canon in history. I will now turn it over to Beth. Thank you, Lamarchi. And thank you, Dr. Givens and Dr. Parker. You've made me want to finish this book. I, I'm about three quarters of the way through and I really want to read that, that last chapter. I also want to thank you, Dr. Givens, for your kind remarks about librarians and archivists as magicians. Believe me, we all read the acknowledgments and we really appreciate that kind of comment. And speaking of libraries, I hope you'll all feel welcome to visit us at the State Library of Massachusetts once we reopen. We're in the Massachusetts State House right in downtown Boston. And in the meantime, uh, we invite you to look at our website to learn about our resources, our services, and our really great collections. If you just go to mass.gov slash LIB, that will take you right to our homepage. We have a, a, a wide variety of formats and topics in our collections, though most of them relate to the history of Massachusetts and its government. We have a large amount of material relating to education in the Commonwealth, and more and more of that is becoming available on our digital, in our digital repository. So please do check out those links which we put in the chat. 
including a link to an exhibit that we did called Back to School, a retrospective view of education in Massachusetts. And Lamurcha, you'll be happy to know it has a whole section on the Abil Smith School. So please do check out those links. And you're welcome to contact us for help with your research questions. We'll do the best we can while we're still working from home. And of course, we'll be glad to see you once uh, we reopen and you'll get even better help from us once, we, uh, once you can visit us in the State House. So on the next slide, you'll see that we have two upcoming events. They, they're going to be very different from tonight's um, talk. Tomorrow, so Thursday, June 3rd, we have in collaboration with American Ancestors and uh, New England Historic Genealogical Society, there's an author talk with Joseph Bagley on his new book, Boston's Oldest Buildings and Where to Find Them. And then next month on Tuesday, July 27th, in partnership with the Boston Public Library again and American Ancestors, New England Historic Genealogical Society, we have a book called The Agitators, Three Friends Who Fought for Abolition and Women's Rights. And that's by Dorothy Wickenden, who's the executive editor of The New Yorker and host of its weekly podcast, Politics and More. And just so you know, one of those three friends mentioned in the title is Harriet Tubman. So I hope you'll be able to join us for both of these presentations. And I thank you. And then I'll turn it back to Kristen for our final goodbyes. Thank you, Beth. Thank you, Dr. Givens. Thank you, Dr. Parker. Thank you, Lamarchi Frazier. This was a very thought-provoking conversation. Thank you all for joining us. Um, to find out more about what the Boston Public Library is offering for programs and resources for people of all ages, please visit us at bpl.org. And some upcoming talks that you might be interested in, um, you can find on also at bpl.org slash events. Um, we do have a talk on the 23rd of June with Christina Groger about education in Boston. So that might be a program that you would be interested in. We have a range of programs for all ages. We hope to see you again soon. Here we go, here we go. The Education Trap um, is the book that I was just talking about. So that might be of particular interest to the audience here today. So again, thank you all for joining us. Thank you, Dr. Gibbons. Thank you, Dr. Parker. Thank you to our partners. Thank you to our behind the scenes team. And thank you for joining us. Be well, good night.